Well, I didn't expect one of the children to say they liked salmon patties for breakfast. Uh, must have some low country roots. If I was uh, in my hometown up the road an hour north, the gas house, as we like to call it, uh, and I had said, how many of you like liver mush? Every hand would have gone up, praise be to God. It's got to be Max liver mush, though. Don't bring down that liver pudding in here. Max liver mush, fried, crispy, and cut thin. Anyway, I'll stop before I get started. Uh, with that said, I also have one personal prayer request for you guys. Keep me in mind, if you will, over the next, uh, I don't know, three to four weeks. I thought I was much more sanctified in my competitive nature than I am. I don't know if y'all know this, I'm a tad competitive. And um, I didn't realize how competitive I was until my daughter started playing softball and pitching. And let me just tell you, God bless you if you're an umpire. Uh, and so forgive, I ask the Lord for forgiveness, and I ask for you to pray for me, and I need to ask Karen Kerr for forgiveness because I gave her a hard time over the years, and now I know. Um, anyway, y'all pray for me. That's a little tougher than I anticipated, uh, but uh, God be praised in all things. As we gather together this morning, turn your attention to John chapter 21. John chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. This is an appearance of Jesus to his disciples. It's the third appearance John, t John gives us of Jesus' appearance to his disciples. This is the seventh overall of Jesus' appearance to people after his resurrection. Most of them happened within the de first day or two of uh, his resurrection. And uh, this one happens sometime later after the disciples have gotten to Galilee and fulfilled God's call on their lives and will for their lives and been obedient to his command, go to Galilee and there I will meet you. And so these disciples are at the Sea of Tiberias and uh, that is where we'll pick it up this morning, verse 1 of John chapter 21. After this, after Jesus had interacted with Thomas, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself to them in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter says to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we'll go with you. And they went out and got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were able to haul it, and now they were not able to haul, haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, "It is the Lord." And when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came into the boat, came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. They were not far from land, about a hundred yards off. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many in the net was not full, was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? For they knew it was the Lord. And when he came, he took bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish, this was the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this word. We pray that as we study it together this morning, you will encourage our hearts and strengthen us as we work our way through it. Speak so I decrease and you increase. Show us Jesus and his provision. Give us a gratitude for him and his grace. We ask all these things in Christ we pray. Amen. So I remember uh, when I was a kid, I used to love to go on vacation. One of the reasons I loved to go on vacation was we got to go out to breakfast. Now, I think going out to breakfast is probably a, is one of the highlights of life. I don't do it much. None of us do it much. We are, go out to lunch, we go out to dinner, but most of us don't go out to breakfast that often. But when you go out to breakfast, you are typically on vacation or you're uh, outside of your normal routine. And so it's a treat. And so I think that's part of why it's so special. I think, too, people just cook better pancakes than I cook at my house. I cook a mean pancake, but I mean, let's be honest. A pancake with a sausage rolled up in it is just fantastic. And you can get it when you go out. And one of the places that we would always go out to breakfast 
when I was on vacation as a child would be to the, one of the 75,000 pancake houses at Myrtle Beach, right? Which everyone was closest to us. And we had a great time. I loved eating breakfast out. And I thought about that uh, yesterday as I was thinking about this passage that I wanted to preach from, John chapter 21. This is Jesus having breakfast with his disciples by the seashore. Now, this must have been an incredible experience. Number one, they got to interact with the Lord Jesus, the resurrected Savior. Number two, they got to see him as he is, and we'll see that in a moment. But number three, they had been working all night, and so they had been striving all night trying to catch fish, and they didn't have a rod and a reel, and they didn't just stay up all night and cast the rod and reel and have a, have a weight on it and go down to the bottom, and they just sat there and had a good time with their buddies, right? They were actually fishing with nets, and they were tossing nets out of the boat, and they were pulling nets up, and they were tossing nets out of the boat, and they were pulling nets up, and they had been presumably all over because any good fisherman knows if you start one place and you don't catch any, what do you do? You move to the next place. And you learn that at the very early age uh, when you first start fishing. Children amaze me. I was one of these children. When they start fishing, they'll start in a spot, a location. They go three casts. They don't catch anything. They move down to the next place. And heaven help if somebody catches one across the lake because everybody's coming to that one spot as if there are 25,000 fish in that one spot, you know? And so they've been moving around from place to place, casting these nets, working. In fact, we're told Peter was, had worked so hard, he had stripped his outer garment, he was left with a loincloth around his waist, and he was pulling the net in. They had been working hard, and so they got ready for the morning, and they were starving. They were hungry. And so God has provided a, a beautiful story for us here, and one with which many of us can identify. Many of us may be hungry in the evening meal, but we understand from working hard all day to sitting down on that evening meal and we, are, uh, we want to devour it because we're so hungry from physical exertion or from working hard all day. The same is true here for these people. This is just the morning meal. It's breakfast. Breakfast by the seashore in Galilee. And all of us who have ever grown up doing any kind of fishing or ever been involved with fishing understand and know the fish tastes better on the side of the shore right after they're caught. Plain and simple, that's a proven fact. Fresh fish taste better. So you can imagine these disciples have a wonderful, wonderful breakfast set up for them. It's a wonderful setting. I want to draw our attention to a few of the things, just kind of work our way through it. The first thing I want to draw our attention to is that Jesus reveals himself to them. So this is a significant breakfast because it's a place where Jesus reveals himself. Look at verse 1, again, of chapter 21 in John's Gospel. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples. The word reveal there is a very important word. If you're reading from an old New International Version, it would say Jesus appeared. A newer, the newer translations, all of the newer translations of the Bible say that Jesus revealed himself, and there's a significant reason for that. Because the language that John uses here is the same language that he uses in chapter 1, verse 18, where he says, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only God who is at the Father's right hand has made himself known to us. And so this is a statement where Jesus shows and makes himself known, or as Paul would later say in Romans chapter 5, he manifested his love for us in that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died on the cross for us. How do we see the love of God? We look to the cross of Christ. How do we know how much God loves us? We look to the cross of Christ. We turn our attention to this passage. Jesus doesn't just appear to his disciples. He manifests himself in his glory. In other words, they get to see him as he is as the risen Lord of glory. There's a difference. There's no mistaking the fact that this is Jesus in the physical flesh. But his physical flesh is different now after he's been raised from the dead than it was before. He hung out with them. He walked with them before. But now, Jesus, after he's been raised, is preparing them for the time he's going to ascend into heaven to receive the crown of glory and to be seated at the right hand of God the Father from which he will come to judge the living and the dead. He is preparing for them for that time when he will ascend into heaven. And so now he just shows up. He comes and goes. There's seven, eight, nine different uh, moments where he shows up and reveals himself. And then he departs. And we know from chapter 20, and Buzzy talked about the interaction between Jesus and Thomas last week. But we know that Jesus just walks through doors now. He's there and he's gone. It's a different 
human body. He is revealing himself. He is showing them who he is. And when we see this, we catch a glimpse that Jesus is indeed raised. And so John says Jesus made himself known to his disciples. He knows they need to be encouraged where they are. Why is that? Well, there's many speculations, but I think one of the things we can note here is that they are at the Sea of Tiberias where they, were, where they had been told to go. That's in Galilee. And you remember maybe from Mark's the Gospels account, we looked at the resurrection uh, two Sundays ago on Easter. We talked about how Jesus told his disciples, you go to Galilee and I'll meet you there. And the Sea of Tiberias is in Galilee. And so they're there in Galilee in that region fulfilling the will of God, the command of God, and he is rewarding them by making himself known to them. He is fulfilling his promise that I will meet you there. But then there's also something else going on here because Peter says in verse 2, with uh, the others who are there with him, there's six, uh, there's six other disciples with Peter. Most likely these are the disciples that John tells us about in chapter 1 who were the first to follow Jesus. In fact, many of them are mentioned here. Nathaniel, and then you've got Zebedee, John and James, uh, his brother, John's brother, James, along with John and the two others who are unnamed, perhaps could be Philip and Andrew. These disciples are there together in Galilee. There's seven of them. And Peter says, I'm going to go fishing. Now, why does Peter go fishing? Well, there's a lot of speculation. If you've ever sat around a small group Bible study, and one of the things I'm thankful about the way we do church ministry here is we have small group ministry, we have Sunday school classes, and we have curriculum that keeps us from just sitting around speculating. And it's important to have conversations, but just sitting around speculating. What do you think this means? What do you think this means? What do you think this means? Well, I think it means this. I think it means that. There's a lot of speculation. The reality of it is we're not told why Peter says, let's go fishing. Perhaps... It was because he was um, bored, right? Peter's just bored. What else does a fisherman do? He's a fisherman by trade. He gave everything up to follow Jesus in Luke chapter 5. They sold their nets. They got rid of everything. They followed Jesus. For three years they followed Jesus. Now Jesus is gone. He has coming and going into their lives. They don't really know what to make of their future. They don't really know what to make going on. They're just kind of sitting there waiting on their next command. Maybe he's just bored and says, you know what? I don't want to be idle. Let's go fish. Make a little money on the side. Maybe it's what we call the side hustle, right? He always makes him a little money on the side. Maybe he's just bored. He wants to go fishing. Some of us go fishing because that's what we like to do. We're bored. We want to go fishing. Maybe they were hungry. Hey, listen, we're hungry. We want some food. So they're going to go catch their food and have their own breakfast the next morning. Maybe they're simply reverting back to an old life. You know, what else do we do? Where are we now? We gave up everything for this guy. Now we don't know what the future holds. Let's just slip back into what we, what, we, what we know, what's familiar to us. Remember, these guys were professional fishermen, particularly Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Maybe we'll go back into our old way of life, or maybe they're just simply disillusioned. And most commentators believe that this is what's going on, that they're disillusioned with Jesus. And I think certainly we could all identify with that. We could all recognize that that's a potential possibility, that as we're there, uh, Jesus has ascended, Jesus has been raised. He's preparing us to ascend into heaven. We thought he was going to set up the kingdom on this earth. Now he hasn't. He's done this miraculous thing, but we don't know what to make of it. And maybe we're just disillusioned with Jesus. And so they're just going to go out and go fishing because they don't know what else to do. Kind of take their mind off of it all. It could be any number of those things. The bottom line is we're not told why, but I think all of us in some way, shape, or form could identify with one of those reasons. Some of us are just bored in our lives. Some of us may be bored with Jesus. And we're just bored because we don't understand what's going on. So we're just taking action to do something else. Some of us may be uh, literally hungry and spiritually hungry, and we're looking for something to feed us. Some of us may be, you know, reverting back to the old life. We gave our lives to Christ, but now we're slipping back into that what was familiar to us before we came to know Jesus because of the stresses of life and the difficulties and challenges. And, and, and it, we're tired of having to constantly do hard things because life has been hard over the last couple of years, hasn't it? Maybe some of us are just disillusioned. Where is Jesus? I once had this great relationship with him. I once was walking with him, and now it seems that he has left me out or he hasn't given me a clarity for the future and I'm just disillusioned. And I want to say that this passage, I think, to a large degree speaks to all of us wherever we are because what we find here is that when they go fishing, Peter leads the group because he's the leader and everybody follows. When they go fishing, 
Jesus meets them where they are, and that encourages us and tells us that Jesus will meet us where we are in our lives. Because that's what Jesus does. Now they go out fishing for the night, and they catch nothing, and Jesus asks them a question. Uh, on the shore, he says, uh, have y'all caught anything, this dynamic interaction with Jesus? He says, have y'all caught anything? And he says, he uses the word children, and many of us read this and say, why didn't they understand who this Jesus was if he used the word children? And the answer for that is that he's not using this word as children with reference to an affection as a father to his children. He's using this word kind of like lads. Hey, hey guys, y'all caught anything? They had to say no. And you can imagine, if you're a fisherman at all, you can imagine uh, how they didn't want to answer that question. Nobody wants to answer a question, have you called anything after you've been out, been out fishing all night? Did you catch anything? Especially the husband when he comes home after being gone and the wife's been home with the children all day. And, hey, did you catch anything? No, that's the last thing. That's why fishermen lie. Anyway, I won't go into that story. Right? So right, they have to come to grips with, no, we didn't catch anything. Jesus is specifically asking them a question to which he knows the answer to make them admit that they haven't done anything out of their own efforts. That's important. There's a poverty here, a, a, an actual poverty of not having fish and perhaps an actual poverty of not being able to feed themselves without going out to work to feed themselves, right? The Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. If you don't eat, you don't work, right? And so the idea here is that they've got to go out and work and, and toil. And when, even when they came to the conclusion of their toil and their effort, without the grace and mercy of God and his provision in our lives, we are still impoverished. And maybe Jesus is wanting them to understand here and challenge them, and I think he is, to say, you know what, not only are you spiritually impoverished without me, you're impoverished without me in every aspect of life. You have been out fishing, and you had to come to grips with no, and in order for us to understand the abundance of the provision of God, we've got to first understand the poverty of our own souls. We've got to first understand the poverty of our own lives. Don't think for a moment... And because you've worked hard or you've got a good job or you're doing a lot of effort, that you have somehow, you have somehow amassed a, a wealth or a fortune or, 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 or created your own successful life. Without Jesus' blessing in your life, without the gift and grace of God in your life, you are nothing. I am nothing. And Jesus wants these guys to understand that. That might be a hard thing for some of us to hear. But for us to be followers of Christ and faithful followers of Christ, we have to realize that we are nothing in his, without him. Nothing. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus says, those who recognize their poverty of spirit. His disciples have to come to grips with that, this interaction with Jesus. Now Jesus says, okay, now that you've admitted you are nothing without me, now I want you to throw your nets on the other side of the boat. Now, this is a practice that was happened, according to many scholars from the back of the day and researchers, that uh, oftentimes with the water, the person sitting on top of the fish could not see the fish because of the way the water's the reflection of the light and the moon, etc. But someone on the shore could see fish and would often tell the fishermen where to throw the net. It was a tandem activity. And so, Jesus on the shore perhaps can see the fish. Perhaps he just knows where the fish are. It says, throw the fish on the other side. Perhaps miraculously brings fish to the net. We don't know. We're not told. And so they throw the net to the other side of the boat. And what do they find? They catch 153 fish, a net full of fish. Without me, you can do nothing. With me, you can do everything that you do. That's what Paul says. With, though it is Christ who strengthens me, I can do all that I do through Christ who strengthens me. And so with Christ, we, all, we do all that we do for the glory of God. And so we submit ourselves and follow Him and live in relationship with Him because it is in Him and through His grace and His provision that we have the ability to do what we do. And so we go to work and we work hard and we receive a wage. And we think we've earned that wage, but the reality of it is, is that God has put us in a position by His grace to put us in a, where we can work, to put us in a position to be rewarded with that wage. And we come home and we manage it according to his principles and his gift and his grace. And we then have what we need through the abundant provision of God in our lives. So they get this net full of fish. They can't bring it into the boat. At that moment, uh, maybe the light gets a little lighter. 
John looks and he says, it's the Lord. Maybe it's the memory that John has of Luke chapter 5 when the disciples are out fishing. and While they're out fishing, they um, haven't caught anything. And Jesus finds them on the shore and says, throw your nets, nets to the other side. They throw their nets to the other side and they catch an abundance of fish. And these guys bring the fish to shore. They leave their boats and they follow Jesus. And Jesus says, from now on, you'll be fishers of men. Maybe John remembers that moment, that initial call, and says, boom, that's him doing the same thing again. Maybe he sees a little better. Maybe he finally recognizes. Maybe he softens his heart. Because maybe the thing that's keeping the disciples from recognizing Jesus is their own unbelief, their hardness of heart. Well, you know that this happens in Mark chapter 6 when Jesus walks on water out to meet them and they don't see him and don't recognize him and they're terrified they think it's a ghost and Jesus says it is I and then he gets into the boat with them and then we're told by Mark according to Peter's own account that they didn't understand the significance of the feeding of the 5,000 they didn't understand that was Jesus because their hearts were hardened. Maybe some of us this morning aren't seeing Jesus in our lives. We're not receiving the grace and mercy of God. We're not coming to the word and receiving the manifestation of God and his glory from his word because our hearts are hardened in our unbelief. We just don't think God can work in that way. Or we put God in a box and said, only you can work in this way and this way, but you can't work in this way. And we're not recognizing him. And so in our unbelief, maybe our hearts are hardened and I need you to understand this as your pastor this morning. These men are believers. These men have seen. These men have prayed, cried out, my God, my God, my Savior, my Lord. And yet still they're wrestling with unbelief because that's a constant struggle in our lives. And maybe we need to harden, soften our hearts. Maybe our hearts are hard. Maybe we need to work on softening our hearts to God, looking for him so that he reveals himself to us. We can see him as he shows up. We don't know the answer, but all we know is that Peter then jumps in the water. He puts his cloak coat on, jumps in the water. Why would Peter do that? We don't have any idea. Other than perhaps it's a reference to a Jewish tradition that it is illegal, according to Jewish law and custom, to greet someone because without being covered up, without having a garment on, because greeting someone was a religious act. It makes no sense why Peter would jump in the water. You and I would take stuff off to jump in the water to swim. Right? Peter jumps in the water and wades to the shore to meet his Jesus. Those two men do something remarkable to me in this story. First of all, Peter takes action. John recognizes Jesus. If you read John's gospel at all, you know John is a very contem contemplative man. He doesn't even refer to himself in the, in, the, in the first person. He doesn't say I. He refers to himself in a contemplative third person way, the disciple whom Jesus loved. I think there's a humility in John here. John's very contemplative. In some ways, he's like Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus in Luke chapter 10. Peter's like Martha. I'm going to shore. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never betray you, Jesus. Before the rock crows three times, you will have denied me. Peter jumps in the water and comes to shore. There are other disciples who stay in the boat. Some get the fish in. Others row the boat in. Everybody in that boat is significant. We can focus on Peter because we live in a world of action. But the reality of it is, is that we don't need a whole bunch of Peters. We don't need a whole bunch of contemplative Johns. If we had a whole bunch of Peters, nobody would ever think through anything. If we had a whole bunch of Johns, nobody would ever do anything. And if we had a whole bunch of Peters and Johns, nobody would have brought the boat in. They would have let all the fish go. And some of these disciples aren't even mentioned. Here's the point. Jesus is there. He feeds all of them, meets all of them where they are, out in that water, regardless of whether or not their names are mentioned, because their importance to Jesus is just the same. You need to understand that this morning. You may not be the upfront person. You may not be the passionate person. You may not be the person who's all fired up for Jesus, but your faith is there, and you're contemplating, and you're walking through, and you're saying to somebody like Clint, hey, why don't you settle down and put a filter on it, big boy? And I said, why don't you get up and go do something, big boy? And then somebody who's not mentioned wants to, why don't both of you sit down and be quiet and let's just work this thing through? Because you've got to have all people according to the grace of God and gifted according to his purposes to be used according to his will for his glory. They get the boat to shore, they pull out the fish. 
153 of them, again, you could sit there and talk about what, what 153 means, but this is what I think it means. I think it means this is what fishermen do. You ever met a fisherman who doesn't know exactly how many fish he caught? And the ones who don't know how many fish he's caught is, either, is lying to you and either to cover up the fact that he caught a lot of fish and don't want you to know where he caught all those fish because he's going to mess up his honey hole, or he's lying to you or she's lying to you because they don't want to tell you they didn't catch nothing they don't want to be exposed to bad fishermen. So you know, you talk to that grandson who goes fishing with granddad and they come in and you say to granddad who's got the honey hole set up, took the grandson to the spot, you know, and you say, hey, did y'all catch anything? And granddad says, oh, we caught a few. And grandson says, no, we didn't, grandpa. We caught 16 and I caught 13 of them. They know exactly how many they caught. That's what fishermen do. Besides that, most likely, there's seven fish, seven men in the boat, seven fishermen. Everybody working together, 153 fish. That's a little over 21 fish per person. Now, they didn't have freezers. What do you think they did with them? Well, as Americans, we ought to understand what they did with them, most likely. Good possibility. They took those bad boys to market. Sold them. Why wouldn't you? You get that foot money coming in there. And anybody who's worked in retail knows you've got to keep up with your inventory because you keep up with your inventory is where you keep up with your product. You keep up with your product, you've got to keep up with your money. So you better believe they know how much they got for a fish and they know how many fish they sold. And I think this just simply means 153. Just a detail that John gives us, just like when Peter was stripped down, to tell us there is truth and this is a reliable account. Only somebody there knows how many fish were caught. But here's the thing. We see in that number, we see in the breakfast, the provision of God for his people. He meets them where they are. He calls them to breakfast. He blesses them abundantly. And then when, he comes to bre- when they come to breakfast, he says, come and eat. And as they come, we see the initiative of God here in verse 13. For Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them and so with the fish. On their way to breakfast, they sat down. Jesus met them where they were. He served them their food. The beauty and wonder of this story is that Jesus will meet you. He knows what you need. He knows what you need and where you are more than you will ever know what you need or where you are. And yet he is willing to meet you where you are and not withhold his abundant provision from you. Without him, you are nothing. But with him, through the power of the grace of God and the gifting that he has given you, you are nothing. His beloved child, and you are everything eternally because you find your rest in the one who is, the one who was, and the one who will forever be. So may we as a church be a group of Christians who together, collectively and individually, learn to trust Christ, walk with him, and enjoy the provision, see him as he is, And trust that he is going to provide. And know that as he shows up, we will see him in his glory. And as we see him in his glory, may we tell other people who he is. John recorded this for you. John recorded this for me. And the countless others who've read it before. And should the Lord tarry, the countless others who will read it after. To testify to the reality that Jesus showed up and made himself known. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to testify? Be encouraged today. Our Lord indeed has risen. There's no ghost can cook breakfast. Jesus meets them where they are and takes the initiative and provides and gives them what they need. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you for this word. We pray, Lord, that we will grow in your grace and we will trust you. We pray, Lord, if we've got hardness of heart, we will seek it out and bring it before you and ask you to soften it through your spirit. We pray, Father, that as we go out, we may be disillusioned, we may be bored, we may be struggling, we may not know what to do with ourselves, we may be reverting back to our old way of life, we may just simply want to go out and get something to eat. We pray that whatever we are doing, you will be meeting us where we are and being sure that we don't go astray, but rather that we come to know you more fully. And we thank you, Lord, for the fact that you continue to make yourself known to us through the testimony of your word and the ministry of your spirit and the work you do in our lives. We ask that you will call us and give us the faith to trust you both now and forever. For it is in Christ we pray. Amen.